Good morning. morning. We welcome you in Jesus' name as we come to worship our Lord and Savior on today being Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, but also the celebration of the church as the Holy Spirit came to the disciples and allowed them to proclaim God's gospel message, and we continue in that ministry in the church, and so we celebrate that today as well. We're glad that you're here worshiping with us, or if you're joining us online, we're glad that you're here. Uh, We follow the order of service that's on our screens or also on the printed sheet if you want to pick up one of those when you came in. I invite you to stand as we begin our time of worship. Today we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Lord said, Come, let us go down and there confuse their languages, so that they may not understand one another's speech. They were amazed and astonished, saying, How is it that we hear? each of us in his own native language. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We join in singing our first hymn together. Holy Spirit has worked faith in our hearts so that we may hear the good news about our Savior, but our sins are always before us. Let us therefore confess our sins to God, our Father. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We are helpless to amend our sinful lives without you, gracious God. For Jesus' sake, help, renew us, and turn our feet to paths pleasing to you. In Eden, God created our first parents from the clay of his good earth. When they ate the forbidden fruit, the word became clay himself to pay for our sins and to rise victorious. Our Heavenly Father has molded you. Christ's peace is with you, and the Spirit is in you to enkindle your faith. I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, on this day long ago, your Holy Spirit used the apostles to preach in power. Breathe new life in us today. Use us, clay vessels though we are, to build the church upon the foundation of those apostles, with Christ as our cornerstone. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our scripture readings. Good morning. The Old Testament reading for today is from Genesis 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament reading for today is from Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying in one, to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, 
lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading from John chapter 14. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our next hymn.
words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts gathered here today be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today we're celebrating Pentecost. So what does a tower, the Tower of Babel, and Pentecost have to do with each other? Why are these two stories used on this day when we talk about Pentecost? By the way, that picture there of the Tower of Babel is actually a famous picture by Salvador Dali, and I actually like that one because it is a yucky picture of the Tower of Babel. And we'll get to why that might be a good way of representing it in the sense of seeing man's sin. But the Tower of Babel and Pentecost, what do these have in common? Well, it's going to deal with a mountain, fire and wind, and God's mercy. So today we're going to see how these things join these stories together and really all of Scripture to see how God is truly working in our lives. So let's begin with a mountain. This picture here is of one supposed place where we believe Mount Sinai is. Believe it or not, we actually don't know exactly where Mount Sinai might be. It's hard for us to draw for that on a map because there isn't a map saying right here is where it was. They just talked about it as people went to it. But this is one of those supposed places where this mountain is. And, and in this place, you kind of see this mountain kind of rises up out of the plain. It's one of those things where it's just a magnificent type of sight. And throughout history, mountains have become kind of these special places. And the Bible also uses mountains as special places where we see God or God's work or powerful work at hand. Why is a mountain important for us, especially in this story here of the Tower of Babel? Well, you see, the Tower of Babel, we believe, was probably a ziggurat or kind of a pyramid almost type of a structure. Not quite a pyramid, but a structure that is kind of built up that they built in the Middle East. And they're all over the place, actually, where you see them. And we think of them as kind of just like a temple place, like when we see the pyramids or whatever. But really what it is, is it's building a mountain. Because at these places, these are sacred sites. God's presence is to be there, whether it's the true God or false gods. It's, it's a powerful place. And so the Tower of Babel is creating a mountain so that the people could have the power of God or at least claim to have the power of God. They were making a name for themselves, is what they were trying to do. And so that's a connection here with the mountain, because mountains are places where God truly works, but what we see is that the people were rebelling against God and trying to do it on their own, by building their own mountain to make a name for themselves. It's a fire. Fire is also another key indicator of God's work. This picture here we have of the pillar of fire over the tabernacle, and this will be important in a moment in the connection there. But, but think of other places where fire was important to show the presence of God. We have the burning bush in which God spoke to Moses and called him to come to the people of Egypt and to um, release them from captivity. And then pillar of fire and pillar of smoke that guided those people. But you even have fire in God's judgment as well. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, the angel that was placed in front of the garden, it says, had a flaming sword. And so God's punishment is also part of fire, but really it's God's presence as well. And God's presence was there, now we connect mountain, at Mount Sinai. When you read the story about Mount Sinai and Moses going up on there, it talks about this, this storm and this, this fire on the mountain type of idea because God is there and that presence is there and then that presence comes down when they build the tabernacle to be there. So fire recognizes the presence of God and where we see fire in scripture, we see God's presence. Now how about wind? Wind. Well, we come to creation. 
creation where we have the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, and God said, let there be light. And oftentimes we talk about that Spirit hovering as a wind. The wind that came to Elijah when he was on the mountain, that still small voice of God speaking through the wind to him. We have the wind that came to Ezekiel when he prophesied over the dry bones and that wind came in and gave life to those bones. We have the wind when Jesus describes to Nicodemus about the Holy Spirit, that it's like a wind coming and you don't see it, but you see the effects of it. A mountain, fire, wind. And now we have the Pentecost story. And how does the Pentecost story begin? Well, with a mighty rushing wind from heaven and tongues of fire that come down onto the disciples. It would be no mistake that the first Christians, the Jewish people, who understood their Old Testament, when they heard this story, would go, this is a story of God's presence and God's action because it connects with all of the Old Testament and the ways that God made himself present in powerful ways. And that's happening right here at Pentecost. And so there is a strong connection there. It's not an unusual event in the sense that they know what happened in the Old Testament. When fire comes, it's God's presence. When wind comes, it's God's presence. But how about about God's mercy. You see, both of these stories are actually also about God's mercy. And that comes in the form of the languages. So in the story of the Tower of Babel, we have the people building this mountain, trying to be like God. And God comes down and confuses their languages. And confuses their languages in such a way that they cannot finish building this tower, this city, actually, they talk about, too. And they leave it, and they scatter throughout the world. Now, when we first look at that and first hear about that, it just sounds like God's punishment. They were doing what was wrong, and so he punishes them and scatters and separates them. And that is true, that God is punishing their sin here. But actually, God is also, probably even greater here, showing his mercy. He's showing his mercy to these people, and really to the whole world, because we are included in that. He's showing his mercy in multiple ways here. First, he says that if these people, really humanity, continues on this path, nothing is impossible for them, and And on one hand, that seems kind of strange. You know, these are sinful, broken people, and he says nothing's impossible for them. But what he's saying there is that if they continue together, what's going to happen is that these sinful human beings, all of mankind, is only going to get worse. If they can accomplish these things, and they are broken, sinful people, imagine how much greater the sin becomes. It's the same thing that God did when he banished Adam and Eve from the tree of life. If you live forever in sin, that's not the way to live. Same thing's happening here. This is actually God's mercy to prevent sin from becoming worse. Becoming to such a point as the violence on the earth that he sent that flood to destroy. And this is a story right after that. So this is God's mercy, actually, by breaking them up in this sense. Preventing the sin from becoming so bad that it becomes unredeemable. But also, God is, in his way, enforcing what he had said at creation was one of the tasks for man to do. To be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And what were all mankind doing at this point? The opposite. Coming together and making a name for them, 
themselves rather than being fruitful and multiplying to the world. And by doing this event here, that this, this punishment of God, he's actually making his plan fulfilled, taking the bad and turning it into good, of spreading mankind out into the world. And so this is God's mercy. God's mercy. At this point in this story, this is God's mercy. Even in the punishment that God does, ultimately it is for our good and our, and he shows us mercy. But what do we do now with this confusion of languages? I mean, it created a difficult situation. And even to this day, there are so many different languages and, and it's so difficult sometimes to communicate. God has a plan for that as well, and that's where we get connected to Pentecost. There are multiple languages all over this world. I don't even know the, the count of the number of languages that there are. And it is difficult at times. If you've ever been in a language class learning another language, you recognize that it isn't one for one. There's multiple different things going on, and so translation and understanding and communication when there are multiple languages becomes a very difficult thing. And as hard as we try, and oftentimes do well, but a lot of times don't do well, it still is a hard and confusing thing. Confusion is still there, reigning from the Tower of Babel. But God is showing his mercy at Pentecost in a very unique way. I mean, we would think that maybe the way to kind of solve this is to go back to that one language. And, and actually, in many ways, the world is trying to do that. Except we can't decide on what language is the best language, and so we have fights over that. But God, instead of going back to one language, created an event that allowed all languages to hear the message of Jesus. That God is proclaimed and they all hear. You see, when we hear that Pentecost story and the listing of all the different nations there, again, it harkens back to the Old Testament and the dividing out of the people because of the languages into these different nations. And so the listing of the different uh, groups there in the book of Acts, is really the different language groups that were there on Pentecost, there 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, there in Jerusalem. On a mountain, believe it or not, Jerusalem is a mountain, and wind and tongues of fire come, and they hear in their own language the message of Jesus. God's mercy to the world. Here, a miracle is happening that God comes to all people and proclaims his love and grace and mercy. God's mercy. His plan that has always been in place, taking what is bad and turning it into good, taking even his punishment and turning it into our good, that God shows us mercy. That's what God's mercy is all about. Showing his love and grace, even when we don't deserve it, showing his love and grace to us. Because he loves us and cares for us. He has the answer for us. When we can't figure it out, he figures it out for us, and we trust in him. And so that's why we say oftentimes in our service, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord, have mercy. And he does. He has mercy for us each and every day of our lives. Amen. We continue now with the prayers of the church. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the love that you have shown to each and every one of us, that you show mercy to us even in our difficult times in our lives. Thank you for the stories and the connection of these stories that you've given to us in your word. From the Old Testament and the Tower of Babel to the New Testament and the Pentecost, all of them showing your grace and mercy to us. 
Remind us always, Lord, to turn to you for our source of strength. And Lord, that becomes so vitally important in our world. We keep seeing violence through the massive shootings, through wars and rumors of wars, to even the conflicts within our own families. As you said, and we heard in the Gospel of John, that through Jesus, you bring us peace. May that true peace come to each and every one of us and to this world, even in the midst of this sinful and broken world. May we find your peace. Lord, we pray, too, for those who are in need of your healing touch, broken in body. We pray and continue to pray for Carol and for Barbara, for Randy and for Ruth, for Lynn and Dennis and John, for Wayne and Janet and Bill, for Estella and for Dennis. Lord, we pray for Gerald Profrock, who's recovering from a serious car accident, and his family as they mourn the loss of Doris, his wife, in that accident. Comfort this family and grant healing. We pray for Crystal and for Janet, for Matthew and Chuck and Joyce, for Art and Profe Maria, for Sharon and Jessica and Gail. We pray that you would come to them in their time of need and give them comfort and peace according to your grace and mercy. Lord, we pray that your word would go out into this world just as the disciples proclaimed your word at that Pentecost. We too, the church, continue to proclaim to the world that you love us, that you care for us, that you bring us mercy. Use us, Lord, to reach to those who are lost, those who are straying away from you, those who do not know you, that they too can come to that knowledge that you are a God who's gracious and merciful, that you are the one who has forgiven all of our sins, and in you we have true life. Lord, we thank you too for today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as we come to this table to partake of your body and blood broken and shed for the forgiveness of our sins, of our sins. May it nourish and strengthen our faith. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful gift that you give to us. And Lord, we lift all these prayers to you, knowing and trusting that your good and gracious will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue now with the gathering of our offering. I invite you to stand as we join in singing the offertory.
prepare now to come to the Lord's table. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. On this day, your Holy Spirit gave birth to the church, providing courage and power to the disciples to proclaim your son's resurrection and to invite all who heard to become part of the living church. And so, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Thanks be to God.
invite you to stand for prayer. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated. Again, we're glad that you worship with us today, whether you're here or joining us online, and we continue in that ministry of worship, both on Sundays and on Wednesdays. If you have concerns, if you have prayer requests, if you have things going on in your lives, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us, that we can connect with you in multiple ways, but ways that we can be together as the body of Christ to strengthen each other. Also, uh, you receive news from here through email or through uh, paper or on our website, uh, to see the different activities and stuff that are going on here at St. John. Thank you also for the gifts that you give to further God's kingdom. Part of the blessings that God gives to us, we use to further his kingdom through the ministry here at St. John and throughout this world. So we thank you for those gifts. Reminder again, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, we have the workout night, um, which is Basically, uh, walking, stair climbing, basic, simple exercises that can be done together or individually. And so that, uh, we're excited about that. Many volunteers that help out with that, but on Tuesdays and on Thursdays. Also, next Sunday, we're going to be recognizing our graduates. And so um, if you have not contacted us already about having a graduate, please do that uh, today so that we can uh, make sure that they're included in our uh, recognition of graduates uh, next week. Also, coming up in a couple weeks now, on June 26th, that Sunday, we're going to have our voters meeting. It'll be right after this service, so right around 10:15. Uh, part of that voters meeting, which is a really important thing, is we um, ratify the budget for the next year, our 2022-23 budgets. Our um, budget year begins in August and runs through July, and so we need to um, have approval for that. And there'll be some other things on the agenda as well, but that's kind of the main thing that's on the agenda. So it's coming up Sunday, June 26th. Any other announcements by anyone this morning? We continue with the Genesis Bible study at least for a couple more uh, weeks, and then we'll kind of take a break uh, for the summer. Our children's um, Sunday school's already taken a break for the summer as well, um, but to invite you to be a part of that if you uh, would like to do that. If not, I'll invite you to stand as we sing our final hymn together, Sent Forth by God's Blessings. Mm -hmm. 